you. <laughs> Madam Secretary, you are a rock star. Well, <laughs> I love being here. Thank you so much. Well, I'm welcome delighted. back to Chicago, and welcome to our audience uh, for being here tonight. So there's one thing I want to get out of the way before we start talking about your fascinating book. You have said that to not recognize your face is in your ledger a misdemeanor. <laughs> but not, to, to, not to, to be ignorant about your pins or your brooches <laughs> is a felony. <laughs> I don't have any felonies on my record right now, so I want to keep it that way. So I would ask you to describe the pin or the brooch you're wearing tonight. Tell us what it is and why you're wearing it tonight. Well, great. First of all, I really am happy to be here. I did live in Chicago, and this is a fabulous city, and it's great to see so many people here. And so this is a very special pin. It was given to me last year by Admiral Stavridis, the Supreme Allied Commander of NATO. And uh, seemed like the appropriate uh, pin to wear. It's a globe, has an right. eagle on top of it. Uh, and uh, he is a fantastic man. And when I was doing, um, helping on developing the new strategic concept for NATO, I got to be friends with him. And uh, we were all together not long ago. And since we are getting ready for the NATO summit, I thought that was a good thing to wear. So. Good. Okay. So you all know. So nobody's uh, ignorant that, about that uh, now. <laughs> okay. So now let's turn to your really instructive and fascinating book, A Prague Winter, A Personal Story of Remembrance and War, 1937 to 1948. As the title suggests, it's really two books at least. Um, it's the birth and the, and the history of Czechoslovakia, its rise to independence in 1918, then being treacherously torn apart in 38, the Munich Pact, its fate uh, a year later with the Nazi protectorate, and then, of course, becoming a communist satellite. And the second part, all intertwined with this wonderful history, uh, it's a very personal history of your family and the discovery of your Jewish heritage. You discovered many documents, uh, both through archaeology in your own garage, and official documents about your family um, archived in many unknown files. Tell us about this research and your personal involvement with the research. Well, uh, th as you pointed out, I did not know about my background, and I didn't really know it until I start the book by saying I was 59, and I thought that I knew who I was and that I really knew a lot about the country of my birth. As it turns out, neither was true. And so what happened was when I was named to the United Nations, um, all of a sudden there were profiles and things written about me and TV profiles. And even though I had a semi-public life before that, all of a sudden I kind of appeared on the public stage. And I started getting letters from people, some of them which said, you know, send money or get me a visa. But um, <laughs> others were um, the kind that, uh, they were, some of them were written in Czech, some of them were written in completely indecipherable handwriting, and, uh, and they basically didn't have the facts right, or they'd have a name, but they didn't have the dates, or somebody would say, I knew your father in high school in 1915, which would have been impossible since he was born oh. in 1909. In um, 96, towards the end of the year, I got a letter from somebody where all the names and facts and uh, dates were right, and it was just as I was being vetted for <coughs> Secretary of State. And so I was in the White House Counsel's office, and they asked kind of the normal question, like, have you paid your taxes, and do you have a nanny, and things like that. And so, uh, um, at a the legal end, nanny. Right, right, <laughs> at, right. And at the end, they said, is there something, anything about you that we should have asked that you might want to tell us? And I said, well, I have just learned that it's possible that I am of Jewish heritage. And they said, so what? The president is not anti-Semitic. Right. So um, I then, over the holidays, talked to my children, who were completely fascinated by it. And they already knew that their grandparents were foreign and that they um, had, they spent a lot of summers with them. And they said it just kind of added the whole 
uh, aspect of, of the story. My youngest daughter's married to a Jewish man, and we were just all ah. talking about it all. So, okay. But then what happened, you're not allowed to talk to the press between the time that you're named and the time you're confirmed. But what happened was Michael Dobbs, a very good reporter from the Washington Post, wanted to do a profile of me. And so my office gave him names of people that he might talk to in Europe. And so on the day that I was confirmed and was sitting in my office, he came and it was a stunning day uh, in terms of giving me photographs of people and said, do you know who this is? This is your cousin. She died in Auschwitz. And this is your, these are documents. The Nazis were really good about keeping track of everything in terms of uh, cards that showed what transport people went on. I was completely stunned, uh, disbelief. And so the only way I can describe it was that I was asked to represent my country in a marathon, the first time a woman had done this. Right. Um, and I was given a very heavy package to carry, not only to carry, but to unwrap as I ran. That's how I felt. So I asked my brother and sister to go to the Czech Republic to begin to uh, unearth things. And they ran into a fantastic man, Thomas Krauss, who was head of the Jewish community in Prague. And that was the beginning. Okay. So there was some documentation that came from that. Then what happened was I felt that I needed to know more and understand the whole story better. And so uh, we did begin. I went back to the Czech Republic. What was interesting was the Czech foreign ministry gave me my father's personnel file. And there was an institute established in Prague for the study of totalitarian governments. And they had charge of all the secret police records that the communists had amassed. So they gave me my father's police, secret police file, uh, which many, many times accused him of being a pro-Western Democrat. Um, and um, so those were the things I worked off of. Then I, because we'd spent the war in England, I also went back to England and went to the places where we'd lived. And then I, in, when I was in the Czech Republic, I went yet again to Terezin, uh, where in fact most of my family um, had been sent. So, and then my garage, which really, I'm embarrassed to say I should be on one of those programs about pack rats or... Um, <laughs> we all have yeah, these, so. yeah. So um, you've said many times that you uh, wish that you could have s spoken with your parents um, and ask them the reasons why uh, they made the decisions they did, how they did it, why they did it. Um, you were very close to your father. Um, it must have been very hard both for him not to reveal this side of um, your family's life and for you not to have discerned that in him. Do you imagine the conversations between your parents and their parents and other family members when they, that led to you leaving your homeland and your eventual con, um, uh, baptism into Catholicism? Um, I do, but um, it's all speculation. Of course. I think the thing that is very hard, I think, is I was talking to one of my older cousins in order to do research for this book, and she said something about when I talked to grandfather and I thought I had never called anybody grandfather or grandmother, Babichka and Dedechek and Czech. Yeah. It was not a con. So for me, my grandparents were, I knew people had grandparents, but I, I did not, we left when I was two years old. And there's a photograph in there with my two grandmothers, but they were not anybody that I actually knew. I knew about them a lot because, and this is the part that makes this so complicated, my parents talked a lot about their parents. I mean, I knew what kind of people they were. Yeah, because you, you, you say at one point in the book how much your father loved uh, his mother. He really adored his mother. Very much, and, yeah. and his father was a, um, an entrepreneur and somebody in the construction business and also someone that had started a factory that actually employed a lot of people in the little town where they lived. Uh, my mother's parents, he was a, uh, had a wholesale shop in their little town and I think they were fairly well-to-do business people. From what I can tell, it's very always hard to separate it, what I know now from, I never, I did not know about their religion at all. Uh, but from talking to people now, I have sorted out that they were probably very secular Jews. Yes. 
Um, and Thomas Krauss, who was uh, kind of our guide through this, said that in many ways the Jews in Czechoslovakia were probably more secular than some of the Jews that were further uh, to the east. And also, I found my, among the various documentations I was either given or found, on my parents' wedding certificate, it said under religion, it's a Czech term, bezbiznani, which means without confession. Right. And it doesn't mean that they're atheists, it's just that they did not belong to a church. So my sense was that they came out of that particular background. Uh, and also what I think, and this is corroborated by other writing, uh, readings that I've done, is that nobody imagined that uh, the barbarism that the Nazis undertook really could happen. So Munich was in September 1938. The Nazis marched in in March 39, and my parents left shortly after that. And so I think that people did not, they didn't imagine that things would be so terrible. The other part that's all of a sudden become kind of clear to me, my parents were very young when they left. My mother was 29 and my father 30. And I had just been born. So I think, I think, because I don't know, my father really was a Czechoslovak patriot and wanted to be with the government in exile. And I have a sense that he, they were encouraged by their parents to go to England. Um, and there was some thought that my paternal grandparents would join them, uh, and my maternal grandmother, uh, my mother had a sick sister and she wanted to stay right. with her. So those are the things I imagine, but it's all imagination because I obviously you never had know. this conversation. Right, right. Um, as I was just telling you before, I think one of the most chilling parts of your book um, is the family chronology at the end of the book because it's a list of normalcy um, of you in England next to horrific events of displacement and murder uh, that were going on in uh, Czechoslovakia. You know, for example, there's your, the death of your grandfather at what became the ghetto at the um, fortress of Teretzin, um, followed by the joyous birth of your sister in England, uh, your enrollment in kindergarten, um, a proud moment, I think, as you describe it, with your uniform of proper English girl, um, followed by two more relatives um, that are transported to Terrazin. Was the stark chronology of that list a way of understanding the sacrifices that your parents made, or is this the academic in you that needs to list these things? Probably both, and I think also as kind of a guidepost to indicate the um, cruelty of what was going on in one place with the semi-normalcy of the other, and a point that I make about my parents, which is that they did everything they could to make the abnormal seem normal. You say that. So while you talk about the normalcy in England, it wasn't exactly normal either when I go back at it. Uh, these people, relatively young, who came from good families, and who I'd, I love to imagine this part, uh, Czechoslovakia was formed in 1918, um, a new country as a result of World War I and the dissolution of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, for people that have been in Prague, they know how beautiful it is, and a lot of it is Art Deco, and very much, and here was this new country. And my parents were the generation that were kind of the new generation that were, and they taught cafe society, and they talked about having this really Art Deco black and white apartment, and live, you know, my mother shopping with her friends, and my father being an, a, a diplomat, a young diplomat. All of a sudden, they end up in England. Uh, my father speaks English, my mother doesn't, and they try to figure out places that they can live, how they can live, and we end up in an apartment house in Notting Hill Gate, which now is very posh. I it live was, there. Well, I mean, it, <laughs> and then I went there, Margot, and, it, and I now see it backs up on Portobello Road, but who knew, you know? And so uh, we lived in this apartment building, right. I remember this, which was full of refugee families. And uh, during the, we were in London during the Blitz, and so 
Uh, now, when I went back to visit there, I, I said a really stupid thing to the woman who lived in the apartment. I said, is the cellar still there? She said, of course it's there. And <laughs> uh, we have had an argument with the superintendent because he will not modernize it at all. I'll take you down. And I had one of these moments mm. where all of a sudden, the same hideous green paint that was down there that I remember as a child was still there. So, and then after the Blitz, we moved out to the country, to Walton-on-Thames, where um, the thing to do was to buy this huge steel table that you could, if you were Tonda. under it, and they said if your house was bombed, you would survive. So I spent a lot of my so-called normalcy um, eating cold meat and bubble and squeak and, and being in air raid shelters right. and my father being an air raid warden. It was normal in comparison to what was going on in Czechoslovakia. And one of the things that was so chilling about the chronology was I think one of the truly amazing aspects during the war period was the Czechoslovak resistance actually assassinated Heydrich, who was the Reich's protector. And it was the only assassination of a high-level Nazi official. And there obviously was retribution from it. And the major retribution was that they destroyed an entire town called Lidice. But what I noticed when I put all the dates together, they were rounding up Jews after that. And right after that, a couple of days later, my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, was sent to Terezin. So the connection between those two things. Or then my... Uh, paternal grandmother and this young cousin were sent to Auschwitz on the third to last train. Uh, if it had been a week later, they would have survived. So right. putting those kinds of dates together was the, the really chilling part. And it was that combination of things, people being born and people being killed, that, that was the horrible contrast. Okay, so yes, it was truly chilling reading that. Um, I know you've thought a lot about the question of identity. Um, you identified as a Czech and as an American, uh, but not as a Jew, because of course you didn't know um, that part of your history. Once you learned that part of your history, um, you must have gone through a process before uh, resolving who you were once again. Um, so two questions about that. Describe that process to us, and finding out that your parents were Jewish was just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, did it cause you to search for your roots? And if it did, how far did you go? Well, first of all, I uh, <clears throat> was raised a Roman Catholic. Right. My parents uh, were baptized in England in May 1941. All the same time, right? All at the you same time. Yeah. I was trying to figure out why, what. And I, again, I just have to keep emphasizing this is speculation. So I don't think it was for them to escape the Holocaust because they were already in England. Right. I also don't think it was in order to fool their friends who must have known they were Jewish, of uh, Jewish background. So I think that it must have had something to do uh, with preserving their child. And um, I don't think a lot of people would question that it was probably safer to raise somebody as Christian than of Jewish course. during World War II. Uh, but also, I think my mother was quite spiritual. And she had some good friends who were Catholic. And I think that that they were persuaded Catholicism was the majority religion of Czechoslovakia or the uh, Bohemia. And um, so I think that was the reason. I speculate, knowing what my parents were like and their value system and their humanity, that had they known that six million Jews were going to die, they would never have done it. But that again is... And you it. say that I in say the book. that. I yeah. think that... Uh, I have tried to, you know, I've, I'm often asked, how did it change my value system? And in a strange way, it didn't, sure. because I always knew about the Holocaust. Nobody ever, you know, I, I was brought up knowing what had happened during World War II. It just never occurred to me that it applied to anybody in my family. But I did know uh, that Munich uh, was the cause of the disaster, and I knew about the fact that nobody paid attention to what was going on, that Neville Chamberlain talked about Czechoslovakia as that faraway place with people with unpronounceable names, um, and that um, the West had kind of let a whole group of people down, and that 
if I, it never, frankly, it never occurred to me that I'd be Secretary of State or Ambassador to the UN. But the bottom line is it occurred, I did know that one had to stand up and not allow this kind of thing to happen. And so my, my parents, I think, brought me up with the right value Values. system about this. So I have been uh, alternately fascinated and just terribly sad. I mean, um, somebody said, well, tell me about the book. I said, it's very sad. They said, you're never going to sell it if you keep saying it's sad. <laughs> uh, but the, the bottom line, it is a very, very tragic story. Right. The positive part about it is that it shows the resilience of the human spirit and hope and that um, there is humanity among people. But um, when I think about it, and this is what I do think about, as I said, my parents really did work to make my life and my brother and sister's life as normal as possible. And coming to America was the most uh, important thing, I think, right. that, that they did. And, and now what makes me so sad is thinking that they knew all this and that they spent their lives making sure that we did not have to live through it with them, right. which must have been really, really difficult for and them. And really, really courageous. Yeah, that, that's yeah. the way I feel about yeah. it. Yeah, no, no, I agree with that. Um, so you're a Jewish Catholic. So how does that work? Yeah. I am many things. <laughs> I am uh, confused. I have interfaith <laughs> discussions. Um, and Hanukkah uh, and Christmas. No, and I mean, because... I was raised a Catholic, became an Episcopalian right. when I got married and right. found out I was Jewish. So, uh, <laughs> but, you know, who am I? So I am those things. I am a mother. I'm a grandmother. I'm a Democrat, big D and small d. I am uh, a, uh, a, uh, somebody who has worked, somebody who has taught, somebody who is very proud to be in the government. Um, I am an American, and as America, I am indivisible. Right. So that yeah. is how. That's yeah. very good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 No, that's good. Um, in your book, you reflect on the enormous debt um, that's owed to the men and women who fought and won World War II and subsequently created the institutions that rebuilt Europe and. Um, detained and defeated, uh, contained and defeated communism. Uh, these institutions played a key role in, in shaping the world for the last 50, 60 years. Um, NATO, you argue, is foremost amongst those. In researching your book and revisiting these historic events that have defined the modern era, how has your views changed, if they have changed, on the importance of these institutions, particularly NATO? Well, first of all, what I think is interesting is I spent more time in doing research on the book looking at the interwar period, which um, had a huge effect, obviously, in, in everything that had happened. Um, and one of the reasons, I believe, that the British and French acted the way they did was that they had suffered a great deal during World War I. The scars of World War I were very evident, and not only in terms of the numbers of uh, young men who had died, but but generally in terms of how democracies comported themselves. And also there were attempts by the powers that be to develop some kind of an international system. The League of Nations existed. There was the Kellogg-Briand Pact in right. order to outlaw war. There were attempts at disarmament. And none of that really worked. America was very kind of literally distant um, in that particular way and had stayed out of things. And yet once... Um, that uh, every, people know the story in terms of Lend-Lease and bringing America in and the relationship between Churchill and Roosevelt, they began to think about what kind of a system should exist after World War II. That is when the United Nations came I into existence in their minds and trying to figure out what were the weaknesses of the interwar structure so that they could develop something that worked. And they began to talk about a North Atlantic, um, an Atlantic relationship. Um, one of the things that I talk about in the book is, I mean, they're kind of three layers. The inner layer is the personal story. The second layer is the World War II setting. And the third is about uh, the importance of leaders, individuals, decision-making. 
And one of the things I talk about is that leaders can't operate on wishful thinking. So Chamberlain hoped that Hitler would change, and Roosevelt hoped that Stalin would change. And so to some extent, um, the post-war immediate alliances were still based on the fact that we could be allies with the Soviet Union. And yet, what the Soviets were doing was systematically accumulating their satellite empire by a series of kind of salami tactics of um, go subverting governments. The direct link between what happened in Czechoslovakia and NATO is, very, to me, very clear. The communists took over in February 1948, and finally, uh, Americans, Truman, figured out what was going on. And so they built on some of the aspects of the Marshall Plan and the Truman Doctrine in order to develop this alliance, NATO, the most powerful military alliance in the history of the world. And what I think was it served its purpose very, very well during the Cold War. It protected, it provided a nuclear umbrella to Western Europe. Uh, it did um, create its antithesis, which is the Warsaw Pact, and so right. you had these two alliances facing each other. So the Cold War ends, uh, the Warsaw Pact is disbanded, and the West doesn't want to disband NATO. In fact, what happens is the countries that were artificially divided by the Cold War wanted to be parts of NATO. And so one of the things that uh, we did during the Clinton administration was to systematically expand NATO. And so you can imagine kind of the personal um, oh, sure. thrill of when I was there in, at, uh, on Truman's desk in Independence, Missouri, welcoming Hungary, the, uh, Poland, and the Czech Republic into NATO. And then it has systematically expanded. So the question is, what is it supposed to do? Right. And again, because life is amazingly peculiar, my father had been the Czechoslovak ambassador to Yugoslavia. And I, uh, the 90s begin, Yugoslavia begins to fall apart. Uh, and so what do we do about it? And I was ambassador at the United Nations mm -hmm. uh, when we were pushing to do something about it. And actually, we, the Clinton administration, were the first to ever take NATO to war. It had, in fact, been an alliance that That's had never right. had to go to war. Right. And what it began to do, instead of just protecting its members, it began to act what we call out of area meaning that it did things outside of the membership. And what it was doing in the Balkans was the first thing. So that was something that you sat down and decided you were going to do Absolutely. out of area. What was because the issue was, what was this alliance that was against the Soviet Union going right. to do? Right. Um, and it was not just a military alliance, but also a political, political. alliance, right. because it insisted that the members be democratic uh, and that there be civilian control over the military. And so one of the more difficult things I had to do when, I, um, when we were doing this was to go and talk to President Yeltsin and say, uh, uh, you know, this is what we're doing. And he said, well, this is a new Russia. You don't need NATO. And I said, it's a new NATO. Uh, it is different. And in fact, we made clear that if the Russians had a democratic government and wanted to, that they ultimately could be members of NATO. This was not against them. So what NATO has done now, and this is one of the things that's going to be talked about here during the right. summit, is what are the out-of-area responsibilities of NATO? Obviously, Afghanistan is the major one. Libya was something that was a NATO uh, campaign. And so this alliance that was set up against the Soviets now has a different mission. And I think that's the interesting part about what has to be talked about in terms of alliance structures. So keep talking about that, because re that really is the next question is, you know, to bring it back to today. And, you know, the um, summit is happening in less than three weeks. And you are co-chairing the host committee for that summit. Um, so, you know, one of, the, one of the things I wanted you to give us your opinion on is what you think will happen at that summit. Um, as, as you look at it um, from the perspective of today, with all the constraints that we have um, 
not only economically but politically today? Well, I think it's interesting to kind of look at the evolution a little bit. What happened was two years ago was the 60th anniversary, right. uh, now three years ago, of NATO. And um, the decision was made by the heads of state when they met in Strasbourg, Kiel, to have NATO have a new strategic concept. Um, and uh, there was a new secretary general. The, um, the last strategic concept... That was in 2010. Uh, 2010, uh, 2009. Um, and so what had happened was that um, the last one that had been written was in 1999 when we were in right. office. So 10 years later, it was important to relook at it. So the heads of state had also decided that there needed to be a group of experts to advise the new secretary general. And so there are 28 countries in NATO now, and the secretary general chose 12 countries to be members of the group of experts, automatically irritating 16 countries. Right. Um, <laughs> and then he asked me to chair it. So, <laughs> but it was a very interesting exercise because it was specifically trying to figure out what was the mission of NATO, enlarged as it was with its own membership protected. Um, so um, among the things that we looked at were the kinds of things that we're gonna look at at the summit. First of all, what was the whole Afghan mission about? Uh, and people began to talk about something called the comprehensive approach, which was that not only is, does NATO have a military role, but there's also a civilian role in terms of trying to help train um, the, who was the security forces, uh, and lessons learned in the Balkans. So sure. Afghanistan was one of the subjects. The other thing we learned while we were doing this um, strategic concept, NATO actually has more partners than it has members. Uh, right. And the partnerships are very important, and they are other organizations. So if you look at what just happened in Libya, mm -hmm. the Arab League was a partner. Right. Um, the African Union is a partner. There are various other, the Organization of Islamic Countries, any kind of organization, and the only way I could visualize it was kind of like a Lego set that you could plug in plug various. In. That's great. So one of the things that, so they're going to talk about Afghanistan, uh, which is even more kind of specific given what the president just did in Afghanistan with President Karzai to talk about what the next steps were going to be, and then how the partnerships work, mm -hmm. which is a very important part. And then the third part, which we also talked about, is what are the defense capabilities of NATO? Uh, and to what extent, um, how does it operate against the proliferation of nuclear weapons, specifically Iran? And the difficult part is that it's very hard to persuade the Russians that the defense capabilities are not against them. Um, Do and they just not believe you? They don't believe it. And uh, I, we spent time there when we were there um, with the uh, strategic concept and they see NATO expansion as a military threat to them. Sure. And the truth is that it is not. It is definitely not trying to do that. I've been in enough meetings to, to I mean, it's just factually clear. But the bottom line is that there are new missions for NATO. And the thing to remember is that NATO continues to be the most powerful military alliance. And you look at something like Libya and you try to figure out, you know, terrible, and it does link to issues we were talking about World War II. One of the things about World War II, one could say, I'm, I wouldn't, but they could say that people didn't know what was going on. We now know everything that is going on everywhere. Right. And so a new concept has arisen internationally, which is if the leader of a country is not only not protecting his population, but is calling them rats and cockroaches and killing them, then the international community has a responsibility to protect. But the question is who carries it out? Who carries out that responsibility? And as of this time, NATO is the most organized and powerful tool to do that, which is what happened in Libya. Well, we, uh, we only have a few minutes before we go to Q&A, but of course that brings up then Syria. So, um, you know, if, you, if NATO did Libya, why not Syria? For well, that responsibility to protect. I have to say, I know this is always a facile answer, but basically no two situations are exactly okay. alike. And you have to figure out what in fact 
is doable. Now, I teach at Georgetown, and I say to my students that foreign policy is just trying to get some country to do what you want. That's all it is. Uh, So (laughs) what are the tools? Right. And I teach a course called the National Security Toolbox. And the truth is there are not a lot of tools in that toolbox. There's diplomacy, bilateral and multilateral. There are the economic tools, which are carrots, which are like trade and aid, and sticks, which are sanctions and embargoes. Then the threat of the use of force, the use of force, law enforcement and intelligence. That's it. So what is interesting from an academic and political science point of view is to look at what's going on. And we are actually going through the toolbox. And on Syria, there is, has been um, multilateral diplomacy, which is going through right. the UN, uh, resolutions and sanctions resolutions. And one thing that we learned about sanctions, because the 90s were definitely known as the sanctions decade, and we found out that sanctioning a whole country often punishes ordinary people. Sure. So we developed something called smart sanctions, which target the leadership and uh, the banks and various ways of kind of tightening the pincers around it. And that's what's going on in Syria, plus also trying to get humanitarian assistance in, non-lethal assistance. Um, There's discussion about safe area, refugee corridors. Um, and trying to, and there's a whole discussion about what to do, never taking anything, anything off option the table. off the table. And so I think Syria is much more complicated than Libya. Uh, it uh, could explode outwards in terms of the neighborhood. And of course we've seen it's already spilling over right. into Turkey. So, yeah. and exactly, Turkey right. and the role right. that it's playing. Right. So, so um, before we go to q and A, I I do want to ask you um, about one um, quote in your book, let me quote from one area, and ask you why you included this, what the message is. Uh, When troubles arise among faraway people, we remain tempted to hide behind the principle of national sovereignty, to mind our own business when it is convenient, and to think of democracy as a suit to be worn in fine weather, but left in the closet when clouds threaten. Why did you include that um, message um, and, and just enlarge a little bit and, and tell us about your perspective um, for some of the challenges we've, we're facing today? I mean, you began to do that um, in, the, in the last question, but enlarge on well, that Well, I little. think this whole concept of responsibility to protect, right. the hardest part about it is the issue of national sovereignty. Um, the issue is, you know, do you interfere in the internal affairs of another country? Um, And the sense is that if people are doing terrible things, leaders to their own people, then there is that responsibility. There has also been kind of an extension of it if there is a massive natural disaster and um, the international community offers, for instance, Burma, when they had the cyclone there, and the leadership at that time didn't want any help, and meanwhile the people were dying. And I, and I often say to my students this, because I think it shows how complicated the concept is. I happen to believe that um, not enough was done to help New Orleans after Katrina. Sure. There were people living, uh, I, I was down there two years after uh, Katrina, and there were still refrigerators in the trees, and Bottom line is that there were people living under bridges, all kinds of things, and one could make the argument that the government didn't do enough to help. So how would we have felt if all of a sudden the Chinese had said, we're here to help you? So the bottom line is it's a more complicated concept than, than meets the eye in terms of interference. And the United States, we are the most protective of national sovereignty. We have not even allowed automaticity with the international Court of Justice and right. various ways that we looked at the United Nations Charter was that we isolated certain areas for ourselves. So national sovereignty, I think, really does become an issue. Then there is the question about democracy. I happen to believe that we're all the same and people everywhere want to make decisions about their own lives. I am chairman of the board of an organization called the National Democratic Institute, right. which 
was started actually under the Endowment for Democracy, a program that President Ronald Reagan had set up. And there's a Republican Institute and a Democratic Institute and business and labor. And what we do is go and teach about the nuts and bolts of democracy. So then there are people who say, well, X group of people are not ready for democracy besides you know, how it's long and complicated. The bottom line is we are now faced with what's happening in the Arab world. And um, I've had some very interesting discussions about this. And I was having, I was in a uh, panel, in just a discussion like this with an Arab. And I said, this was in December, and I said, well, we can't call it the Arab Spring anymore because it's the winter. So I'm calling it the Arab Awakening. And he got okay. really mad at me. And he said, you can't call it that, because that makes it sound like the Arabs have been asleep all this time. <laughs> uh, and I said, so what would you call it? And he said, Arab troubles. And I said, well, what about Arab opportunities? So in those four sentences, sure. you can see a different approach. I think that what is happening in the Arab world is as big a watershed as anything that we've seen, the end of the Cold War, and it's a long story. Um, I don't think that the media did us any favors by covering it as if it were a spectator sport um, that was of short duration. And it is people trying to figure out how they can play a role in their own government. And so I believe in de democracy is not an event. Democracy is a process. And okay. it goes through many ups and downs. Um, and sometimes the wrong people get elected. It happens in this country. And and you have another election. Um, right. And so the bottom line is, is right. that um, you can't just put democracy on as if it's uh, just a suit of clothes. And so I think we have to understand the process and give it time and, and be supportive of it. I'm finding it very difficult to listen to people who say, oh my God, Islamists have just gotten elected. The bottom line is, in Islamic countries, it is Who more than elected. likely sure. that a uh, Muslim is going to get elected. Yeah. Um, and so we can't just lump everybody together. They right. are, to get back to religion, they are not uh, monolithic. Every religion that I've been uh, <laughs> uh, uh, has extremists in right. it of some kind. Fundamentalists. So I, yeah. I think that uh, one has to, to be careful. And then the lesson that my father, he, we came to the United States in 1948, and he spent his life writing about the fragility of democracy and the responsibilities of citizens to be educated to support it. And he wrote several books he on did, this. Yes, yes. yes. Um, so then um, uh, the skeptics about NATO, um, about the G8, you obviously think they're still very important, these summits that we have. I think have. they're very important. Why are the summits well, important? Well, summits are very interesting because in many ways they're action-forcing mechanisms. Um, they, uh, the bureaucracies get going uh, in every one of the countries because uh, the leaders need talking points. They need to have what's known as deliverables. Um, and I think that it motivates the system and then, believe it or not, because it is individuals, is the idea of being together, uh, trying to make a decision and, and showing unity other, is, right. is very important. Um, and so um, I think Chicago will have an interesting time with it. There are a lot. I mean, it was easier when there were 11 or 16 or whatever. Now These are a lot. And then they're the 50, friends of yeah. NATO. Um, and we had the last summit in Washington. Uh, and it, it's complicated, but I do think that it's very important, and the G8 yeah. also. And what's going on now, Margo, is that there is a searching for what the right international institution is. I have never seen the world in quite such discord. Uh, a, it's a mess. That's right. a diplomatic term. And so, uh, and the institutions, as you were talking about, right. we're not sure how they work. They were invented. Uh, 60, 70 years ago now, and I think that there's an issue as to how they're working. There is not confidence in any institutions at the moment at all. Oh, okay. I think it's true in terms of our uh, state governments and our federal governments and international. I think the mayors and city councils have the most 
um, greatest have illicit confidence because they're closer to the people. But generally, there's this kind of disquiet about uh, what in, who's in charge and what are the. And then added to that this year, it's very interesting. There are more elections taking place this year than I've seen in a long time. So four out of five of the permanent members of the Security Council are having elections or changes. So we are, the French, French. are, the Russians just had something, the Chinese <laughs> um, um, are going to have a change of generations. Right. And in the last few days, it sounds as if the British might, in fact, call right. an early election. So there's that. Then there are elections in India and Mexico and Venezuela. There's some discussion about an election in Israel. So there's an awful lot of Change. kind of turmoil. And so I think having the summit is a very important kind of glue discussion and sense of common purpose among countries that are democracies. So do you get, and then we really will go to the audience, um, so the, sh um, the Chicago Council has, for the last um, several months, put on several events like this one um, to teach us all about the summit and some of these questions. Um, I've been to several of the events, and I'm often confounded by diplomatic speak. And I assume there's a course somewhere at Belitz that I should take. <laughs> um, you're a private citizen um, now, but also a very um, powerful private citizen. Do you get to say what you want without diplomatic speak when you talk to some of these diplomats you used to negotiate with? Me? Definitely, yeah, but I definitely. Even did it at the time. Uh, <laughs> you did? I, okay. I had a way that I did things, which was that one began with diplomatic speak. And then the part I think people don't believe is that when you're sitting like this and the other person is a foreign minister, you actually have to begin a conversation in some way, and it does right. begin in normal ways of friendly talk. Uh, but, you know, I, I traveled a lot, and I would go somewhere, and I finally would say, I have come a long way, so I must be frank. Um, <laughs> and I, and I do think that, that in fact, good. what does happen is that there's some very... Um, very direct talks. Good. What does happen at these meetings that's also interesting is there are the plenary sessions, but there also are an awful, awful lot of bilateral meetings right. where various people will meet on the, as they call it, on the margins of the meeting. And that, this is the part that people don't believe. There, there's a whole kind of series. You actually could sit down like this. Uh, or you have what is known as a pull aside. You're in some big meeting, and literally somebody pulls you aside, and you Into now the get to talk the, to this okay. minister. <laughs> or you just shake hands. Great. Or this does not happen in this kind of a meeting, but at the UN, there were always instructions about people you don't talk to. <laughs> uh, so trying to keep President Clinton from talking to Castro was a very <laughs> big deal. Uh, and, but there are all these, these various kind of min, minimal to maximal ways that they talk and begin to do business. And then there is a way that it accumulates. So there's a lot that, that happens. Some of it is diplo speak, and some of it is, is diplo pretty... Diplo speak, that's yeah. the right word. Okay. But if at the end they say, this has been a very frank and candid meeting, it didn't go well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you see, I knew there was yeah. a course you should take. <laughs> yeah. uh, Thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah. We're going to open it up to the audience. Yeah. Thank you. That, uh, yeah. And it's quite an audience. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's difficult, I have to say, because they, part of the thing to remember is that whoever you're talking to has some agenda on their side. And the mo at the moment, I think the Russians are going through a massive identity crisis. Um, and I try to visualize this in some ways. They were the other superpower for a very long time. Uh, during the Clinton administration, we had the rather peculiar assignment of devolving the power of our major adversary in something short of a, of a, a land war. And so they are having trouble trying to figure out exactly what their role is. Um, they are certainly not as powerful as they were, and Putin has come back in a way in order to show the power of Russia. Um, and I think it is very hard to gain their trust. I think what we're trying to do now 
is to gain their cooperation on Syria specifically because they are the ones that are um, giving support to Assad and we need their help in that. But I think it's important for us to put ourselves in their shoes but understand that part of the problem is their um, identity issues. Uh, and it is important to work with them. I would not look into Putin's eyes and say, I trust him. Um, and I think that they are going through a very hard time. They are having their own um, set of issues of people beginning to demonstrate. And then there were stories, yesterday was May Day, and so there were stories in the paper today about there's a, not an uh, insignificant number of people that are former communists. And so um, I think there are a lot of changes there making it a very difficult point. I have to tell you, my pin issue, I uh, did in fact wear pins to signal things and I got into terrible trouble with Putin on this. I <laughs> completely disagreed with his policy on Chechnya. And at the last NATO summit, uh, what happened, it was a complete accident. President Clinton and Secretary of Defense Cohen and I were sitting on a sofa and I don't know who did it first, but we did the hear no evil, see no evil monkeys, the three of us. Uh, it was a pretty crazy picture. And so um, I was shopping somewhere and I saw three monkeys and I bought the monkeys. And so we walk into the summit with the Russians in June 2000. President Putin turns to President Clinton and says, I, we always notice what pin Secretary Albright wears. Why are you wearing those monkeys? And I said, because I think your Chechnya policy is evil. Talk about a mistake, not <laughs> different. Uh, and he was Love furious it. at me. And yeah. he said, you have no right to talk to the Chechens. How dare you do this? And President Clinton gave me this look like, are you out of your mind? You have just <laughs> screwed up the summit. So you have to be very careful. <laughs> <laughs> OK, next question. Yeah, Catherine, the woman in the, the red and white right back there. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. What are your thoughts on using SWIFT as part of the sanctions? What? what Sorry, so could you repeat the question? Again. Swift, using SWIFT as part of the sanctions for Iran? Yeah. Uh, I think it's very interesting because SWIFT is the, the mechanism for trying to control transfer of monies and banking. And I think that one, uh, this is something that very much goes to the point that I was making earlier in terms of looking at smart sanctions. One of the issues when um, I went to the UN originally was when there were complete sanctions on, um, on Iraq, Saddam Hussein. And so then there has been this specific way of developing targeted sanctions. And one of the ways I think is in order to really make sure that the financial system uh, gets tighter and tighter. I believe that there are those who are semi-opposed to this because they don't want to see the international financial system um, in any way used this way. But the bottom line is I think that it's a fairly effective way to get control over some of the transfers of money that the Iranians are involved in. Okay, next question. Yeah, the gentleman right there, Anna, with the blue shirt and the red tie, please. Um, you've spoken of the changing role of NATO and the United States post-Cold War. So what do you think of the continuation of the embargo on Cuba? Um, the embargo on Cuba. So let me just say this. When uh, President Clinton came into office, we did begin to think about normalizing relations with Cuba. Uh, there was a small group that worked on this. And again, I was at the UN at the time when the um, shoot down of um, the unarmed civilian planes uh, happened um, over international waters. And the embargo had always been an executive act. And what happened after that, it became a law, Helms-Burton, which makes it more complicated in terms of, as an executive act, the president could cancel it. When it's a law, uh, you have to pass another law. I think that uh, the problem becomes the following, which is that, um, Things have changed somewhat in Cuba. Um, Castro has always used the embargo in many ways as an excuse for all the things that have gone wrong in Cuba. But um, 
and, and also what happened when we were in office, because Helms Burton was the law and we tried to operate within the law, I put in what we called a set of measures which allowed for more interaction between us and the Cuban people. So people had always sent money, remittances to Cuba, but what we decided to do was to allow money to go legally because otherwise it just kind of, there was an awful lot of corruption and also to increase the number of flights between Havana and Miami. Then President Bush pushed, didn't like that program. He set it back. President Obama has increased it so that there's much more contact. And there also are changes within Cuba itself. Uh, a lot of people have been taken off the government roles. Uh, there is now the possibility of kind of small entrepreneurs. Um, and uh, I think the issue is whether um, one could get agreement on this in Congress. One can't get agreement on Congress with anything. So the bottom line is, I don't know because it's a, it is a law now and not an executive agreement. But I think in many ways it has probably outrun its usefulness. Um, and that with the changes in Cuba, what I would like to see is more and more contact of people to people. Um, and I spent my whole life studying changes in communist systems. And the question is why it was more complicated in Cuba than in Central and Eastern Europe, and partially because the original charismatic leader, Fidel Castro, was still there instead of a bunch of old apparatchiks, and also because it's an island. Things are changing slowly in terms of the leadership changing and the penetration of social media and the visit of the Pope there just now and a somewhat different approach by the Catholic Church in Cuba. Yeah, next question, right here with the suit on, please. Thank you. A number of years ago, uh, Dennis Ross came through and spoke to the council about the need to use uh, more diplomacy or tools of diplomacy in the world. And uh, it seems that President Obama has, has taken that to heart, uh, especially with respect to Iran. What is your take on how that's progressing and what role NATO does or might have in that? Um, I think that um, Dennis was a good friend. He wrote a very good book on statecraft and really did talk about, because um, we actually spent a lot of time together talking about which tool to use when. We spent, you know, I think if I were to ask any of you if you'd like to spend a little time at Camp David, you might say yes. I can tell you after two weeks in the rain with the Israelis and Palestinians, I don't care if I ever go back. Uh, <laughs> We used every conceivable tool in terms even of showing movies and uh, taking people to Gettysburg and all kinds of things. Um, I, I do think that uh, what we are, what is going on now is, especially on Iran, a systematic use of the tools. It's very interesting. I do teach and I am able to lay out a lot of what is happening. So, for instance, on Iran, we have not had diplomatic relations with them. So trying to figure out what is going on internally is difficult. And so there is some usage of bilateral diplomacy by other countries. There has been a usage of the multilateral diplomacy, again, in terms of the United Nations and putting sanctions on them. We just talked about some of the financial ones. Then also what has happened is the international um, system with the, the uh, IAEA, the uh, Inter International Atomic Energy Agency, has sent people in to try to figure out what the Iranians are doing. They're not getting the right answers, so they're going back to the Security Council. But what has happened, I believe, as a result of the economic tools, the sanctions, and the multilateral diplomacy, we are now in talks with Iran. Uh, the P5 plus one, which are the Security Council, the permanent members, and Germany are talking with Iran. There was one set of talks in Istanbul. Another one will happen in Baghdad. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, President Obama made very clear to Prime Minister Netanyahu that containment was not good enough and never taking the military tool off the table. So. Uh, I think that the, it is systematically working by not taking any option off the table. Um, and it's very interesting to follow the discussion in, uh, in Israel, for instance, where there seems to be 
um, some division in views about what ought to be going on, and even most recently a discussion about the possibility of elections in Israel, which then also might affect the way they feel about the use of the military option. But, you know, if it weren't, it is a very, it is a dangerous situation, but it is interesting in kind of following out the usage of the, of the toolbox. Thank you. Um, yeah, right up here, please, in the front, the lady in the white. Please wait for the mic, it's right over there, thanks. Uh, what are your views of a future of South America and its relation uh, with the United States? Well, one of the things is that obviously uh, Latin America is uh, in our part of the hemisphere um, uh, and the closest relations that we could and should have. I think, however, it is never easy, if I may say so frankly, is that part of the issue is when we don't have very active relations with Latin America, they feel left out, and when we do, they think we're interfering in their affairs. So it is complicated. Um, both President Obama has been uh, to Latin America. He just was uh, in Colombia. They also, President Rousseff of Brazil was here. Uh, Secretary Clinton has gone a number of times. And I think that there is a sense um, to try to have kind of the solidarity of the Americas. The most radical thing I did as Secretary of State was to move Canada into the Western Hemisphere. Now, in case you didn't know, it was in Europe, uh, according to the State Department. And so I felt it made sense to have it in the wow. Western Hemisphere, because it is. Um, uh, <laughs> but the reason I did it was in order to get another strong democracy in, in terms of looking at how we could work together on a whole host of issues. The biggest problems that we have continue to be with Venezuela um, and how that is going to carry out. One of the things, I used to carry around a set of maps which showed the progression of democratic govern governments over authoritarian ones. And the democratic ones were in green and the authoritarian ones were in red. And the only thing that was left was that little island. Um, what has happened is because democracy hasn't delivered in all the countries, uh, some of them have gone authoritarian, and Venezuela is a perfect example, I think. In terms of democracy, there had been a democracy, there had not been a recognition of the indigenous population enough, and I can understand how Chavez got elected. Uh, but that is the issue of how the democracies can really function. I do think that what is essential, and it was very interesting, I was at a dinner with President Youssef of Brazil. I think they are going to be, could be one of the major partners that we have in terms of looking how, um, uh, what kind of a relationship to have with Latin America. Mexico, interestingly enough, the immigration is down from Mexico, not just because some of the laws in Arizona are crazy, but also, because they actually are, they're, they're doing better economically. Um, and so I think that, but it's always one of those kind of balancing acts in terms of how much to be involved because we want to, but it, it never turns out, I think from the Latin perspective as being equal enough of our respecting uh, the national sovereignty of a lot of Latin American countries. Thank you. And then uh, one last question over here, please. The gentleman with his arm up in the second to last row. How do you see North Korea evolving, and is there anything we or the world can do about it? Well, I think that North Korea is one of the very dangerous flashpoints. I am still have the rather dubious honor <laughs> of being the highest level Ameri sitting American official to have met with Kim Jong il. Um, other people, I mean, President Clinton and President Carter have gone, but not when they were in office. And so when the Clinton administration <clears throat> was in office, we were very, very worried about uh, North Korea. They had, um, I won't go through the, all the stories, but they were pulling out of the non-proliferation treaty, all kinds of threats. We had very poor intelligence on North Korea. 
Our intelligence said, before I went, that Kim Jong-il was crazy and a pervert. Uh, I went there, He's, he was not crazy. And uh, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, thing that happened, I have to tell you, what had happened was that they had sent the number two man to the United States to invite President Clinton to go. And we were sitting in the Oval Office, and President Clinton said, well, at some point I might go, but the President doesn't just show up, I'm going to send the Secretary of State. They weren't thrilled to hear that, and so we didn't have an embassy there, <clears throat> so we had absolutely no idea what was going to happen. I did go. I sat in the guest house until they said, you have to go see my, you know, the embalmed Kim Il-sung. So I went to see the embalmed Kim Il-sung, and then I got a message that Kim Chung il would see me. So we had a press conference, and... Um, we're standing there, and I see that we're about the same height, and I knew I had on high heels, and so did he. Uh, and his hair was a lot poofier than mine. Uh, but we actually had some very um, long discussions in which I learned that he was smart. He was really smart. And we had a number of discussions about uh, missile ranges, and he accepted the fact that we could have forces in South Korea, and we were in the middle of talks, and then there was a transition to the Bush administration, and they didn't want to continue that. So um, I think now it is um, something is going on in terms of who's in charge. Um, it, it, it's stunning that they decided to go ahead with this um, satellite rocket missile test, which failed, uh, which obviously was a huge embarrassment. They had a parade in, they are honoring the 100th birthday of um, the, uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the grandfather, and the bottom line is that they, I, I, I just read an article that even maybe the missiles that they were displaying in the parade might have been phony. Right. Um, and so they do have a very strong million man army that worries us. Their people are so poor that they're eating bark off the trees. Uh, and so there's a disconnect, and whether the military's in charge or the son, Kim Il Jung, the son is in charge. Uh, and so there are many, many questions about it. Again, interesting story today about all of a sudden the number of mobile phones in North Korea, mm -hmm. so that people are beginning to be able to get information out. But what it leads to, and, and one of the reasons that um, there's that so much of an interconnection in what is going on. We believe that the Chinese are continue to be the best way to deal with the North Koreans through the six-party talks. And the hope is Secretary Clinton and Secretary Geithner are in China now trying to figure out how to deal with them as they are going through a massive change. Uh, I think the issues to do with Bo Lai, the local leader, that has been ousted and not allowed to run. All that is affecting the decision making. And meanwhile, the North Koreans look very unsettled and there is a concern that they might do a test of a nuclear explosion. So it is dangerous, there's no question. And one of the issues in terms of the toolbox is, you know, what are the leverage that we have against them? So there are certain sanctions against them. They want to be taken off um, various lists and have what they want more than anything is to have normal relations with us and it is the one thing that we have to grant them and we don't want to do it until we can figure out what they're up to. So, uh, Ladies yeah, and gentlemen, you. please join yeah. me in thanking Secretary Albright and Margot Thank Pritzker. Thank you. It was fun. Thank you, Margot. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'd ask 